He always used stories to illustrate spiritual truth. They're called parables. And everybody likes a good story. And Jesus was accused by the Pharisees and Sadducees and some of the religious leaders of fellowshipping and talking to sinners. And they didn't think you should. And so he told this story. He told about a, a son that wanted to get his inheritance and leave home. And it's well known around the world as the prodigal son. It's a picture of a young man, maybe out on a farm. He has a brother, an older brother, and he goes to his father, and it was the law of the land, and it was the law of the day that he could ask for his inheritance. And being the youngest son, he inherited one-third of the estate. And his father was a wealthy man. And the father tried to talk him out of it. He said, Dad, I'm tired of being here on the farm. I'm tired of being under your authority. I'm going to go to the big city, and I'm going to live it up. So he decided that he would go to New York or he would go to some great city. And uh, he took his money. And when he got there, he found some people that were very happy to be his friends because he had money to throw around and money to spend on them. And he took them to the best plays and he took them to the best restaurants and the best nightclubs. And he had a marvelous time for a short time. The Bible says there's pleasure in sin for a season. Then it comes to an end. You can have a good time in sex, in getting drunk, I'm told. And I see it on television. They seem to be having a good time, but there comes an end to it. There's an emptiness to it. It leaves a void and you never get enough. And he was very much like young people in our modern generation. They don't want to be told what to do. And that's what young people are saying, some young people are saying to their parents and teachers and the local police. Some of them are saying, have sex now. Don't wait for marriage. Buy now on credit. Pay later if you can. Assert your independence. Assert your dependence. Do your own thing regardless of the consequences. The Atlanta-based Center for Disease Control says that the number of American girls who are sexually active by the time they're out of high school has jumped from 28% in 1970 to 51% last year. It's currently estimated that one in 500 adults in the world are now infected with AIDS. And it's going to be an epidemic that some people feel could destroy the human race unless we find an answer to it and find it soon. This young man in Jesus' story sets out. He's going to live that kind of life. He wants all that he can get out of life, the good times. Out of sight of anyone who might know and criticize him, free to do as he pleases, there are over a million runaways in the United States every year. I realize many left home because of abuse and so forth. A recent article told of a boy who turned to life on the street when he was 12. And he said, I was a kid in trouble. I was in trouble with the law, with drugs, with alcohol, with my mom, with school. I was both drug addict and drug dealer. I was a criminal and a victim. I was an abuser and abused. And how many of our young people have gone to the streets and left home? Street life is a dangerous business, let me tell you. One out of every three runaways is lured into prostitution within 48 hours of leaving home. With the threat of AIDS, prostitution is a slow form of suicide. Almost all street drug users share needles. In their hunger for a fix, most in ignore the precautions against AIDS. Street kids die quickly and quietly, we are told in our magazines. In America, more than 5,000 teenagers a year are buried in unmarked graves. Did you know that? 5,000 teenagers a year are buried in unmarked graves. Teenagers are not, only the, are not the only runaways in our society. Hundreds of thousands of men and women 
run away from each other and their marriages through divorce. One person speaking of an affluent community in Southern California said, everyone here is running from something and this is the last stop. There isn't anywhere to go from here. I saw a book with a, little, with a title the other day in the bookshop, Help Lord, My Whole Life Hurts. And how many hurting people there are here tonight. This prodigal son is a picture of all of us because all of us in a way are running from something. Some of us have to depend on some sort of sedative just to get through the day or some sort of jolt, some aid to get through the day or through the night. We've aimed for our personal happiness and missed the mark of God's plan for our lives. Jesus said, you serve me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. Many of you go to church. Most of you, I'd say, have been baptized or you have gone through confirmation. But deep inside, there's a void, there's an emptiness, and you are not certain that if you died at this moment, you'd go to heaven. You are not sure that you're ready to meet God. You're not sure that you know Christ. You're running. All, us around, all around us here tonight, those of you that are listening outside, running away from something. This boy squandered his wealth and wild living. He spent it all and had nothing to show for it. In Isaiah, the 55th chapter, it says, Why spend money for what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen to me and eat what is good, and your soul will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Hear me that your soul may live. When John F. Kennedy was on his way to that place in Dallas to give his last speech the day he was assassinated, he had in his speech this passage from Mark, the eighth chapter. For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? In other words, you could have the whole world. It's not worth if you had it all, which you can't get. If you had it all, it's not worth as much as the soul that lives inside your body. You see, you have a body, but living inside is your soul or your spirit, that part of you that can have fellowship with Almighty God. And that's the part of you that's lost. And that's the part of you that needs renewal or dedication or redemption. And then this young man got to the city and had his wild fling. Then a depression came. It wasn't a recession, it was a depression. And let me tell you, I lived through the depression of the 30s and there's a great difference between a depression and a recession. What we're going through now would have been considered a great affluent depression compared to what the people of the 30s lived through in this country. And a depression could come again, we don't know. The picture of this young man's recognition of his condition. Jesus said he began to be in need. The first thing that happened was he lost his money. He couldn't get a job. He lost his friends. They were fair weather friends. And he didn't know what to do. Jesus says he began to be in need. He was hungry. And so he finally got a job feeding some hogs. And uh, you see him in that hog pen. Here he was, the son of a wealthy man. Out of his own lust and his own greed, he had wandered away from home. And now he has a job feeding pigs. But he, while there in that condition, he learned what the real life is all about. He was very humble. He became sorry. He said, I will arise and go to my father. My father has servants that have far more than I have. I'll go back to my father and I won't be his son anymore. I'll say, Father, when I get there, I'll become a servant if you'll only take me back. He said, I will arise and go to my father. Father, I have sinned against heaven. Notice he said, against heaven. And in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be thy son. Here you don't find any trace of arrogance. 
not trying to justify what he'd done. He realized he had sinned, and he cast himself on the mercy of his father. In King David's great confession of sin, in Psalm, the 51st chapter, 51st Psalm, he says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Because in this passage, Jesus is teaching us God is the Father. He, lo he loves us. He longs for us to return. He longs for us to come back home. He wants to give you guidance in your life. He wants to give you a peace and joy and assurance that if you died, you'd go to heaven. But first, there must be a change. You must turn around. That's called repentance in the Bible. Repent, the Scripture says. And so it says, in, and he arose and came to his father. He arose. He had to leave the pig pen. And that's why we give an invitation at all of our crusades. We give people an opportunity to take that step of repentance toward God. Many of you need to take that step tonight. Well, when you get back home, what kind of reception are you going to get? He didn't know. So he staggered in his dirty, filthy, smelly clothes back toward the home that he had left. And the scripture says, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. God's not waiting to judge you. God's not waiting to condemn you. God loves you. He sent his son to die on the cross for you, to shed his blood for you. He wants to put his arms around you and receive you back to himself. You've wandered away from him. And he will take you and forgive you and love you and be your friend. God is a God of love and mercy. Oh, yes, there's coming a judgment. There'll be some day when you will stand before God at the great judgment day and you'll have to give an account of your life here and you'll have to give an account of what you did with Jesus Christ on this very night because there's going to be a judgment. But God's judgment is also tempered by his love and his mercy. He's willing to forgive you tonight. He's willing to give you a chance tonight. Today is the day of grace and salvation for all who will come, not because we deserve it, but because what Christ has done for us on the cross. By the cross and the resurrection, God has provided a way for you to have peace and joy and happiness in your heart. And as you're growing up, you need guidance. You need direction. Not to just wander about, but some destination something to guide you. God will guide you. In Romans, the sixth chapter, it says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In 1 Peter, it says, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Now, he didn't come like some young person would probably come back and say, Hi, Dad, how are you? Did you miss me? Can I have my old room back? No, he didn't come with that attitude. He came in true repentance. True repentance doesn't presume on the grace and mercy of God. It can only come when the Holy Spirit convicts you and draws you to God. Beware of the attitude that says, I know that I'm on the wrong road, but I'm not tired of it yet. I'll repent and come back to God somewhere down the line. You may not be able to repent because the further you travel on the road away from God, the harder your heart gets. And the less you think you've done anything wrong and the less you think you need to repent, you must make that choice tonight. And the scripture teaches to come while you're young. Some of you think that you're too bad to come to God, have done too many things and gone too far. 
If you feel a tug in your heart to make your commitment tonight, you come because that's the work of the Holy Spirit working on you right now. I don't believe anybody is here tonight by accident. I think you're here because God saw to it that through a series of circumstances, you're here on this very night. The Holy Spirit is at work urging you to come. Don't harden your heart. The Bible says, He that hardeneth his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. Now is the time to come. Now is the time to receive. Jesus told the story of this man, this young man, because the religious leaders had accused him of associating with bad people. Jesus told them there's great rejoicing in heaven over one person that repents. One person making his commitment tonight will cause rejoicing in heaven. You need to come home to God tonight. When that young man came, his father grabbed him in his arms, kissed him, ordered his servants to prepare a banquet for him, ordered that the finest robe in the house was put on him and a gold ring put on his fingers to signify that he had been received as his son again. He didn't take him back as a servant. He took him as a son. And that's what God will do tonight from you. Our, we just, our last crusade before this was in Glasgow, Scotland. And here's a letter from Scotland that I want you to hear. This is from a girl. I think she's about 19. No, 18. Before you came to Glasgow, I was an 18-year-old with a very big chip on my shoulder. I thought God owed me so much. I thought no one loved me. I thought there was no meaning to life. Something was missing in my life. I thought I was having a lot of fun. I was going out with the guys and getting drunk. I hated my family and felt so unloved. To be honest, I still feel unloved. Even by my family, they think I'm just a loser. One of my brothers used to sexually abuse me. The other one beat me up. I feel like I have it rough with very little love in my life before this week. I'm no angel. In fact, I'm a totally awful person. A few months ago, I was expelled from school and I was blaming drugs. My parents are still mad at me. My dad is a doctor and my mother is a teacher. They say it looks bad on them having a daughter like me. I don't fit in with my family. I heard you were coming to Glasgow and I said I would not go. But where I work, I was told I was assigned to do first aid every night at the crusade. And I was not happy. I went on Tuesday and I mocked you. I laughed at you. I said, what does he know anyway? I said, doesn't he know God does not care for us? But I guess I was listening anyway. On Wednesday, I said, I don't deserve God's love. I never cared if anyone saw me or what anyone thought. I felt loved for the first time. And on Thursday night, I came forward and received Christ as my Savior. I want to know this God who loved me more than anything. I feel loved as I write this letter. I have been received home. That could happen to you tonight. We receive hundreds of letters like that every week as young and old alike come to Christ. How many divorced people meet at a crusade like this? They come to the crusade, they receive Christ, and they decide to remarry. And that happens time after time after time. You say, well, Billy, what in the world do I have to do? First, repent of sin. That word repent means you change your way of living and tell God that you're sorry for what you've done and you come in humility. And then the second thing is by faith you receive him. You say, Lord, I receive you tonight. I talked to a man today. He said, I, I go to church once in a while. 
He said, uh, I burn a few candles once in a while. And he said, I think that maybe indicates I'm a good man. I said, you have to go further than that. You have to receive Christ into your heart and your life and make him first in every decision you make. From now on, Christ is your leader and guide and savior. He died on the cross and shed his blood to forgive all of your sins. He rose again. He's alive. He's coming back again. And someday he's going to set up his kingdom on this earth. And we're all looking forward to that day. And you can be in that kingdom beginning tonight. You don't have to wait till he comes back. You can come tonight and be sure. And there are many of you here tonight that are just not certain of that. And you'd like to make sure. And you want to surrender your heart and your life to Christ. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat from all over the stadium and come and stand in front of the platform and say, by coming, I receive Christ into my heart. You say, well, why do you ask people to come forward like this? Because every person that Jesus called, he called publicly. Did you know that? Everyone was public. There's something about making a public declaration that settles it and seals it. And you're saying to God and the whole universe, I take my stand for Christ. I receive him as my Savior and my Lord, and I'm going to follow him. And if you have been in the church but have wandered away from the church and wandered away from God. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Tonight, I want to speak about a blind man in the Bible that came in contact with Jesus. It's found in the 10th chapter of Mark's Gospel. The 10th chapter of Mark's Gospel. Beginning with verse 46. And they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out. And he said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried the more a great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort. Rise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garments, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I may receive my sight. But there are many people today that are just like that. I read the other day that there are 42 million people in the world who are blind. Health authorities estimate that from all causes, half a million children become irreversibly blind around the world each year. And this is a great tragedy, and many people and countries and health agencies are working to turn it around. A tragedy of equal or greater proportion, though, is the spiritual blindness that people have. Because the Bible says you have two sets of eyes. You have physical eyes in which you can see, and you have spiritual eyes. And you can see physically, but you may not be able to see spiritually. And spiritual blindness affects everyone in this audience. There are thousands of people here tonight that you can see me up here, but you are spiritually blind. And it's a blindness that keeps you from really knowing God. Now, Bartimaeus was a blind man. And he came out of uh, the little place where he had spent the night. And he never had any hope that he'd ever be able to see. And he would go outside the gate of Jericho and he would beg from the people that passed by. People on the way to market or people coming to their business that day. And he would say, help the blind, help the blind, help the blind, help the blind. He had his cane. He had an old shaggy coat. He'd begged some bread from a woman as he'd gone on his way and he got some milk. And there he sat with other blind people and other beggars, and they were begging, hoping that the people would throw them a little bit of money or give them something. And so I look at Bartimaeus, and I see myself, or I see you. 
The Bible says he is blind spiritually. And our world leaders are groping. I listen to some of these things on television from some of our world leaders, and I'm amazed at the spiritual blindness. And I have talked to some of them privately, and, and I, I just I, I want to reach over and grab them and shake them and tell them that they need Christ because Christ could go open their eyes. And I think only the, the true believers really know what's wrong with the world because what's wrong with the world is a spiritual problem. Now this Bartimaeus could not see his rags, he couldn't see his filth, he couldn't see even beauty. And from time to time we read of someone living in a house or apartment that's filled with empty containers and refuse and garbage. And the person living there may appear to lead a perfectly normal life. And they're well-dressed. I know a home like that right now where the lady is well-dressed, uh, the husband is, is a doctor, and they are respectable, they're fine people, and when you see them out, you, you think they're the most wonderful couple in the world. But if you ever get into their house, it is a mess. It looks like a hog pen. And that's the way it is with so many of us. We appear all right on the outside, but down in our hearts and in our souls, we know that something is wrong. And for some reason, the person doesn't seem to even care. The scripture says, but the natural man, that's the ordinary man, the man before he comes to Christ, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And it seems foolish for me to stand here and tell you that because Jesus Christ died on a cross 2,000 years ago and rose from the dead, that that can have an impact on your life today and now and give you assurance and peace and joy that you never knew before and help settle many of the problems and relationships that you face and give you a burden for your fellow man. But it's true. And some people would call that foolish. The Bible says that the pro proclamation of the gospel is foolishness to them that perish. You see, you are blinded by the God of this world. Now, who is the God of this world? Jesus called him the devil, the prince and power of the air, the prince of this world. There's another force in the world. And that other force has supernatural power too, and that other force is the devil. And there is a conflict going on, the conflict of the ages between the forces of God and the forces of the devil. You say, why does God allow that? That is a great mystery. It's a mystery as to where the devil came from. Now, the Bible tells us in the 28th chapter of Ezekiel. It also tells us in the 14th chapter of, of Isaiah. We get a little picture of it, and we get other pictures and glimpses throughout Scripture. But there is a devil. Now, he's, he doesn't rule in hell. He's never been to hell. He's alive. He's settled on this planet. Now, you can call evil anything you want to, but we all know that there's evil in the world. And we all know that something is wrong, but we don't know what. Now, the Bible tells us that back of it all is the devil. You say, but why doesn't God kill the devil and get it all over with? Well, someday God is going to do just that. He's not going to kill him. He's going to throw him into the lake of fire. But that day hasn't come yet. But the devil has already suffered a great defeat. And there's been a great victory by God at the cross. The cross looked like a defeat for God, but it was actually a defeat for the devil. And you and I can enter into the victory that Christ won at the cross when we come to know him. But till then, the God of this world has blinded our eyes, so our eyes are supernaturally blinded. And that's why only the Holy Spirit can lift those blindfolds that are on your eyes just now. He was not only blind, this man, but he was poor. And we read about the poverty in the world today, and it breaks our hearts. Many of us are suffering tonight from spiritual poverty. And then this man was not only blind and poor, but he was helpless. Bartimaeus expected to die in his blindness. No one could heal that kind of blindness. But there was a ray of hope to Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus had heard many rumors of this stranger from Galilee that was going up and down the country healing people and helping people and preaching to people. And he heard the approach of a great crowd of people 
His ears were very keen and he could hear them. He heard the children. He heard the people talking among themselves. And he said, what's going on? What's going on? Nobody would tell him and the crowd was getting closer and closer. And he grabbed the skirt of a fellow that was passing by and he said, tell me, who is this passing through town? And this stranger that no one knows his name turned and said, Jesus of Nazareth passeth by. And Bartimaeus thought to himself, Jesus of Nazareth, I've heard about him. I've heard that he can heal people, that he can help people. Maybe he could help me. You know, there only comes a few times in our lives when Jesus of Nazareth passes by and we have an opportunity like we have tonight to receive him. You see, people have been praying and the Holy Spirit has been working and many people have already received Christ. And what an hour and what a moment for you to come. This stranger gave him the message, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. I remember the story of the Surgeon General of Portugal, a former Surgeon General, and he was walking down the street one day and a piece of paper stuck to his foot. He went home, he pulled it off of his shoe and looked at it, and it was a gospel tract, and he decided to read it, and he read it. And to make a long story short, he was converted to Christ and became a great Christian leader and a great Bible teacher. Just a simple little witness like that. God can use all of those things, and that's why we ought to always be faithful in our witness, because you never know when that waitress in the restaurant or that person that you meet at your work, they'll watch your life, of course, to see if you're backing it up by the way you live. Jesus has been passing by in Hamilton. Jesus has been passing by in the Golden Horseshoe. He may be passing by in your home. He may be passing by in the room that you occupy at a hotel. He's passing by here in southern Ontario. And in desperation, Bartimaeus cried at the top of his voice, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. And the other beggars said, close your mouth, close your mouth. The magistrates will hear about this and they'll come and put us in prison. But he kept on crying out. This was his one moment. This was his one chance. Jesus was there and he was going to take advantage of it. And the others said, keep still, Bartimaeus. Who wants to hear anything from a poor old beggar like you? But the more they rebuked him, the more he cried out. And I want you to notice several things about it. First, he cried for the right thing. He cried for mercy. He needed other things. But the thing that he needed most of all was Christ. He needed God. Have mercy upon me, you son of David. Have mercy upon me. That's what we all need tonight is God's mercy. Mercy. When I stand at the judgment seat of Christ, I'm not going to say, Lord, uh, I want justice. If I get justice, I'm going to end up in hell. I want mercy. And God has offered his mercy from the cross. And he says, I will forgive you and cleanse you from every sin that you've ever committed. You'll never have to face the judgment. You will never be in danger of hell if you surrender your life to Jesus Christ. And so you have to say, first of all, I am a sinner. You have to say that to yourself and maybe to others. Just like an alcoholic. Before you can help an alcoholic, you, they have to be willing to say, I'm an alcoholic. Before you can help in drug addiction, you have to say, I am a drug addict. I need help. And when you come to Christ, you must say, I am a sinner. I need help. And oh, Lord God, please help me. And then the second thing, not only did he cry for the right thing, but he cried to the right person. He cried to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, the only one in all the world that could help him, stood right there. And all of his hopes were centered in him. The Bible says none other name is given among men whereby we must be saved except through the name of Jesus. To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Jesus had said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And this man, Bartimaeus, was coming in the right way. He was coming to the right person. He was coming to Jesus, the Son of God. And he cried at the right time. Jesus was passing by. Suppose he had waited and said, I'm going to see what the scribes and the Pharisees and the religious leaders have to say about him. I'll wait till he comes to Jericho again. Jesus never came to Jericho again. 
He may never come in this way again like this. When will we ever see a sight like this in Hamilton again? It's been a long time since this many people came and heard the gospel and so many people worked and prayed and believed as they've done here and the churches united and cooperated as they've done. And God has been speaking and many people have been finding Christ and tonight you can find Christ. No, he called at that moment. The Bible says, He that hardened his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off and that without remedy. In other words, when you hear the gospel and do nothing about it, it hardens your heart a little bit more. The God, the Holy Spirit, will continue to speak to you, but you can't hear him because you get deaf. The Bible says, He from his joined to his idols, let him alone. There comes a point. I don't know where it is or when it is, but there's a point beyond which you can go. That your heart is so hard that even though God will still speak, you cannot hear. So come now while you have an opportunity. The great governor Felix was trembled when Paul was speaking to him about the gospel. And he said, go your way, Paul. When I have a more convenient season, I'll call for you. But he never had a more convenient season. That was his moment. That was his hour before God, and he didn't take advantage of it. The Bible says, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow. There may never be a tomorrow for you. This may be the moment for you. He that hardened his heck neck, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off. Notice how Jesus met his need. Here was a great crowd of people, and we have a a way today that we think in terms of great crowds. There's a great crowd here tonight, 18,000 people, I'm told. And we think in terms of crowds. We think in terms of filling out churches and filling an auditorium or having a big crowd at a ball game. We think in terms of crowds. But it's interesting, not only did Jesus preach to the crowds, but the greatest sermons I think he ever preached were to individuals. He stopped and stood still when this blind man called him. A great crowd of leaders were around him. He could have said, I don't have time. I'm on my way to Jerusalem to die for the sins of the world. But he stopped on his way to the cross to hear this beggar's cry. He stopped dying on the cross in order to hear that thief say, Remember me when thou comest to thy kingdom. He stopped when a woman touched his garment. And Jesus will stop for you tonight. Because you see... He sees you tonight as though you're the only person in all the world. He doesn't see you as a part of this great crowd. He sees you as you are. He knows all of your thoughts and all of your intents and all the struggles that's going on inside of you. And the Bible says he loves you and he died for you. And if you had been the only one in the whole world, he would have died for you. And Jesus not only stopped, but he said, call him. The scripture says in Luke 19, 10, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. You're lost psychologically, spiritually. You're lost. You need somebody to find you and put their arms around you. That's what he'll do for you tonight. And there was a surprise on the face of the people in the crowd to call that poor old blind beggar filthy and dirty. The first time anyone, I suppose, had ever called him. Someone threw his cloak about him. Someone gave him his cane. He threw them both away and came running and fell down before Jesus. And Jesus asked him a strange question. He'd been blind all these years, and Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you? Can you imagine that? What do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, and that word Lord means that at that moment he had received Christ into his heart. My very own Lord, that I might receive my sight. And I think he was talking not only about his physical eyes, but his spiritual eyes as well. Scientists believe that 33 million of the 42 million blind people in the world either can be cured or their blindness could have been prevented. Spiritual blindness cannot be prevented. It's caused by sin, and we all have it. But it can be cured by the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll open your eyes, and he can open your eyes tonight. What is your need? What do you want Christ to do for you tonight? What do you want me to do, he said. 
Some of you say, I want him to forgive my sin. I want him to give me assurance and so that I can know that if I died at this moment, I'd go to heaven. I want peace. I'd like to rededicate my life. I've been baptized or I've been confirmed, but somehow I don't have that personal relationship with Christ and I don't have that walk with him that I ought to have and I'd like to have that. And so I'd like to reconfirm my confirmation vows, whatever it is. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you whole. Not money, not good works, but your faith has made you whole. Last December, an 18-year-old student pilot named Kim was making a solo flight cross-country when she became lost in a storm. She couldn't see anything out the windshield of her small plane. She didn't know where she was or how to get out of the storm and back to the safety. Something had gone wrong with one of her instruments. So she reached for her radio and made contact with a local air traffic controller, and she said, I don't know where I am. I need some help. Please, please help me. The controller located her on his radar screen and began talking her down toward a nearby airport where the weather was good. She couldn't see a thing, but he could see her on the radar. He knew where she was, which direction she was headed, where she needed to go, and the best way to get there. She trusted her life to a man she had never seen, whose name she did not know, and he got her out of the storm and safely to ground. Tonight, you can trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You've never seen him with your naked eye. You may not know him, but he's there waiting for you with open arms to help you. So I'm asking you to quit flying blind. Trust yourself to Jesus Christ. Follow the guidance of his instruments, which is the Word of God, the Bible. And then the scripture says, and immediately, immediately he received his sight. For some people, it's that quick. For other people, it's a period of time in which you're convicted of the Spirit of God and you grow gradually into the knowledge. But there comes a moment when you make that step from death to life, from darkness to light. I'm asking you to take that step tonight. And if you have any doubts about it in your heart, make your commitment tonight. Did you know that each night we've been here, we've seen more than 700 people both nights, each night come to Christ and come and make a commitment? And what I'm going to ask you to do is what we've done all over Latin America, all over Europe, all over the Orient, all over America, all across Canada. We've asked people to get up out of their seat and come and stand in front of the platform and say, by coming, symbolically, I need Christ. I want his mercy. I want his love and his grace. I want to know him for myself. Why do I ask you to come forward and make that a public declaration? Because Jesus hung on the cross publicly for you. He didn't do it in private. He did it publicly. And people were against him, sneering at him. He was naked and bleeding. And he did it publicly. And he said that if we're not willing to confess him publicly before men, he will not confess us before his Father, which is in heaven. It's a public commitment. And I'm going to ask you to make that commitment tonight. And after you've all come and stand here, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you and give you some, a book that you can take home with you to help you in your Christian growth. And if you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait. If you're in a bus, they'll wait. And you people in the other auditorium or the other room that could not get in here, you can get up and come and the ushers will let you in this building so that you can join those that are going to come. And from the balcony, it's taking a little bit longer than I thought the first night. It's going to take at least three minutes for you to come. So get up and start now. But don't let a little bit of time keep you back. And don't let the big crowd keep you back. You just get up and come because it's you before God tonight. The most important commitment that you have ever made. And if you want to bring a friend with you, bring your friend. But get up and come. And don't let anything keep you back. We're going to wait and people are going to be praying all over this great Colosseum as you come. You'll never have another moment quite like this. You come. We're going to wait right now. And after you've come.